Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with the Spending Time Podcast. I am joined by a blog to watch is David Braddon. Hey. Hey everyone. So a couple of days ago, uh, team of blog to watch, we had a like powwow for like uh, Swatch Group Apocalypse because there was a bunch of news coming out, um, you know, all at once about the new Swatch Group products because they did not participate at Basel World 2019. We don't know if they'll ever be back to Basel World. We sure as hell hope so. Um, and we want to talk about some of the top new watches from the Swatch Group. Not every single brand kind of participated in this launch. It was mostly what we would know as a prestige brand, so that's Omega and Up. So let's begin with the 50th anniversary Apollo 11 Speedmaster. So this is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. And we know that Omega would be there with the Speedmaster to commemorate the occasion. And we have, I don't know, I, it's, it's nice enough. I don't know that it's revolutionary. I'm not, I'm not sure that we, we needed to expect revolutionary. This, I, I guess, other than the bracelet, I'm not really sure if there's anything here which I feel is, is novel. Mm. Yeah, that's, well, what people wanted, and imagine how many Speedmaster and Speedmaster Apollo fans there are out there. And they wanted something that really goes with, with the original memory and the original uh, occasion of the whole thing. And I think they got it. I, I think Omega wanted to be a little bit conservative and a little bit cool about it. So that's why the 9 o'clock subdial has this cool little graphic and why uh, the 12 o'clock marker has the two dots and it has the old logo and so on. So it's, it's a mixture of things that Omega thought that its collectors and, and fans would want. It's, it's kind of like if the moon landing was Disneyland, this would be like a souvenir product. Like, <laughs> I, I know they're all souvenir products, but I mean, the, the rear of it has, I guess, their version of the famous picture that has the footprint. And yes. then they put the quote on there. That's one small step for mankind or for man. Why, you know, or, or uh, I just totally screwed that one up. That's one s small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, which yeah. is this very you know emotionally heavy statement. We remember it's it's just printed right on the back. Um, you know, what my <laughs> favorite thing, thing is it's oh, a go good thing you weren't there on the moon because <laughs> imagine Ari Adams checks in from the surface of the moon and screws up this two liner. <laughs> <laughs> All I had to do was read two sentences. That would that would not look good on the case back of an Omega. So, what your favorite thing is? My favorite thing is the um, the number of the limited edition sixty nine sixty nine, very appropriate Omega. You know, it just it wants to have something for everyone, right? And just throwing in sixty nine sixty nine in there is <sighs> just you know it's something for the teenagers to laugh about. Yeah, well, it certainly is for one thing, and for 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 another, I've I've seen so many people flip out uh, even under Omega's like on Omega social media channels that it's not a proper limited edition, but. This thing is like some people are never really happy because if it's a lower amount, then it's not going to be enough out there, you know, for everyone to have one. If it's a higher amount, then it, why is it so high? So it's a, it's it's a tough crowd. Out it's there. You know, look, it's nice enough. Um, if I got like a good deal on one, I'd be like all into it. But it's about ten grand, ninety six yeah. ninety six fifty. Again, yeah. I'm sure they'll do great. I mean, again, as a watch collector, was I super excited? Not so much. The actual one new Omega, and for me, the only, well, the only really new model, I think we'll agree, was the new Seamaster 300M chronograph. Two registered chronographs, same movement as in the, the, the modern Speedmaster. It's fine. doesn't break any new ground. It's fine. Um, but I really liked the orange bezeled Planet Ocean with a white dial. Again, nothing new. Not a new size. Yeah. Uh, this bezel existed on a very expensive Planet Ocean from several years ago that we covered that was fun. It had like, you know, it was precious metal. I think it was like wow. platinum. It was awesome. Just, um, just, a, quick, just a quick word on the, on, on the chrono before we get into the orange one too much. I, I, I'm really not, not a fan of this chrono with the, with the wave dial. It's just such a mixed bag of, of design elements and so on. It has this laser-edged wave dial that looks really great on the non-chrono version, the, the regular version. And now there's all these bunch of different texts and lines and curves and shapes. It's, I don't think it, it, it looks great. And the subdials are tiny and then the dial is large and then the bezel is even wider and the case is thick. It's proportionally 
some in some, from some angles it looks pretty good at this three quarter view from the side and the front you know halfway between the two it looks okay with a black dial when you don't see so much of the stuff going on but other than that i'm really not a fan i think it's it's just all over the place it's not a pretty watch i think it has a functional appeal to it because i think that people wanted to see obviously new seamaster 300m chronograph it had to have an in-house movement a fully in-house movement that is and it had to be a master chronometer and the chronograph movement that was previously in the Seamaster 300 chronograph uh, was not it was coaxial but it was not a master chronometer and and Omega is trying to go all mas uh, master chronometer I think that's what they're trying to do I think eventually they want to phase out anything which is not master mm. chronometer and yeah. just have master chronometer um, you know movements so this is part of that strategy is again well, is this a pretty watch not really but you know, again, the, I, I'm like you. I prefer the three hand. Yeah, I don't mind the movement at all. That's that's not my issue. I mean, I I just would have wanted to see something else happen with the waves, as opposed to this cool wave dial that does genuinely look good on the three hand with two sub dials and a date slapped on it. You know, it's, it's, it just doesn't really really look like, uh, right to me. But that, it's it is, you know, it is. for me, I look at something like that. I'm just like, it's not for me. Um, yeah. The Planet Ocean. Yes. I think is really cool. Watch. Orange ceramic bezel, $6,500 on a bracelet for a 600-meter uh, dive watch. It's it's still a little on the pricey side, but yeah. you know what? It comes with this cool NATO strap. It's, it's, you know, it is a master chronometer. For me, this is the top new Omega for, for this, you know, May launch event. I don't know what they call it. Okay. Yeah, time to move. Yeah, that's that's the name of it. Blanc Pond, Air yeah. Command Chronograph Watch, pretty, pretty unoriginal, but pretty. Yeah, this could be anything. I mean, if you remove the Blanc Pond logo from it, it could. Take, I mean, I'm sure some people will will uh, argue that oh well, well Blanc Pond has rights to it because they made something similar a thousand years ago. That may be true, but everyone was making something like this a thousand years ago. You know, I so mean, it's. Look, you you look at it, you're right. They have a picture of the vintage model, so they're telling everyone we made this in the past, but like I can only get so much of these vintage re-releases per year. And Blanc Pond, it's Blanc Pond like it's like they open their eyes and they're like, "Oh wait, we haven't done enough of these." So in like a 3-year period, there's like 12 of them. Yeah. Not much else going on there. I I don't get me wrong, I like this watch. Way and it looks way better than the Omega. More proportionate, less text. And it's better distributed across the dial, less but textures it's, it's, and it's so on. But it's true that it's it's true that it's pretty. It's got yes. the cool propeller automatic rotor. It's it's gonna be a successful product. I just wish it was a little a little bit more kind of like oomph to it. Yeah. But it's nice. Eighteen thousand five hundred Swiss francs. That limited is the to block. 500. Oh, is it limited as well? Yeah. Yeah, to just five hundred pieces. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, there'll be all these different colors of it and things like that, but um. That might be a sleeper hit, you know? I, I think yep. that even though it's not that original, it has sort of a, a nice sex appeal to it. Here, here's the thing what I what I look for when I see some some new release, especially if it's a chronograph and it's under 20 grand. I, I ask myself, like, would I get this or Steel Daytona? Because technically these are going up against that. And against the Steel Daytona that's been systematically trading for between 17 to 20K, this is a better option. This looks better. It's not going to... You, you're not going to... See it everywhere. But here's the thing. Movement here's so the on. thing. This is the problem. Yeah. It's a nice design, but when you see this out in the wild, your first thought isn't that's a Blanc Pond. Let's assume for a second that Blanc Pond had the Rolex, uh, you know, brand power, which it doesn't. But let's assume that it did. Rolex has a more distinctive design. When you see the Daytona, you're like Daytona. When you see this, even if you're in the watches, you're like, what is that? Oh yeah, yeah, it's a Blanc Pond. Maybe in a couple of years, but. Is this watch ever going to be popular enough to have the recognizable face of a Daytona? But not everyone wants that. That's the point. I, I, th that's exactly the point, that it's not necessarily a bad thing. Sure, but when you're talking about value, so I'm saying that the, the value to a lot of people of a Rolex Daytona is, yeah, but a lot of people know that I was able to afford a Rolex Daytona. It's true, but to a, to a lot of other people, it's not part of the value. It's part of something that drives them away. Sure, so. sure. 500 people, for sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Glasshütte Original came yes. out with probably like 
the most amount of new products, just given that the CQ has two different case, case sizes as well as a limited edition version of it. Mm -hmm. And the CQ is in the new pillar of of the brand, which is Specialist, but written sort of in German. Why um, is it called CQ? I, 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 don't, I don't get it. CQ is not the world's best name for luxury watch. Um Seek. Maybe that or like Sea Quest. I'm going to go with Sea Quest or Sea Queen. The Sea Queen for sea men. Queen. For him. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe Sea Quinn. Maybe it's Sea Quinn for short. CQ. I mean, look, it's – again, when it comes to, to names by German brands and Japanese brands that I don't understand, I just have to assume for the sake of argument uh, that it sounds cool to them. Like yeah. how many – names of Japanese watches to us sound completely silly but they all named it that technically so, all of them okay all well them. you know someone someone at at citizen for example might think a particular name that we think you know we snicker at is awesome so when i see cq yeah. we we know the people of the brand very well like these are not dorky people they would have not called it if they thought it was dorky sounding so yeah i'm just going to assume you know it it sounds it makes awesome sense in German. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we've been to the museum in the city, and we've seen watches like this from the the '60s and stuff like that. So this is not a new design. This is this is Glasutte taking. I think it's like it was GUB, right? I think it was. That's what it was labeled at the G -U -B, time. GUB, yes. And this was part of the state-run watch manufacturing center of Germany. And so these were, I guess you could call them communist watches, but they were cool. And now the brand has created a 43 millimeter wide size as well as a 39 and a half millimeter wide size both called the CQ one just called the uh, the CQ 1969 one the panorama date the panorama date is going to be a little bit more modern version of it people are saying it's a replacement of the uh, sport evolution and in a sense it is but not really it is because it's a diver style rotating bezel and it solves a lot of the things that people would have wanted right it has a ceramic bezel to it um it has you know a slightly more mo it has the caliber 36 movement so that's the best movement that the brand makes right now that in terms of performance it's a hundred hour power reserve it's got silicon it's just it's it's such a great movement so you can't compete. So many other movements are not going to be able to compete. It's kind of like a really high-end Zin. But you're not talking about a CQ, right? Or are you? I am talking oh, about the, the CQ. Oh, with the, with the panorama date. That's a different movement, yeah. Yeah, yeah so but this a, is the caliber 36. Yeah, all I'm saying is that the, the other version that doesn't have the panorama date has a different movement altogether with a way shorter power reserve. So, no, it's still a caliber 36. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. No, that's 39. No. It's, it's caliber the 39. The 39 doesn't have the caliber 36? Yeah. So what I'm saying is that there's the CQ with a date at 3 o'clock, and that's a different watch from a movement perspective. They look extremely similar, but the one with the beige, um, uh, what is that, luminescent on the dial, that has a different movement altogether. No, let, let's, let's find out, because I actually, Rob was the one that wrote up And the it does, caliber 39 with 40 hours of power is okay. the regular okay. thing. All right, all right, so that's a, that's a significant difference as well. Um, yeah. Again, the 39 and a half millimeter wide version of this watch is going to be kind of for the purest. Um, look, some men... 39 and a half looks fantastic in a sport watch. For me, I like the look of a bigger one, but if you're the type of guy that a 39 and a half sport watch looks great on, by all means. Um, I just think that if you can handle the larger size, you have a much a much more compelling movement in my opinion. Both movements are fine. But I'm yeah. saying when you're spending, you know, what is this? This is like I forgot what the price was. It was oh, it was close to 10,000. Yeah. 11,000 euros. Okay, so 12,000 euros. 12,200 euros, steel watch on the matching steel bracelet. This is the CQ Panorama date. And you want to have, in my opinion, the absolute best possible movement. Black dial, blue dial, it's up to you. The blue dial is, gonna, is, prob is probably going to be the top seller for a while. Black dial is very, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very nice. I think one of the mistakes that the brand is doing, tell me what you think, and Rolex figured this out a while ago. So the CQ with a black dial has the, I think it's C3 colored. It's like a kind of creamish green. It almost yeah. looks like very light cream spinach. 
yep. as you know a call it, we'll call it like mint right we'll call it as the loom color and I don't associate this with the luxury color I don't know why so I think if it was white colored that this would look a little teeny bit better what do you think it, it, they're going for the traditional look for sure but I just think from a from a fashion perspective I don't know that a lot matches with this color of green that's why the the aged you know the faux vintage loom has done better. so well because it's kind of a sand color yeah that's true one thing you have to note though is that not only the movements are different but the case with is different too so the one with the panorama date has 43.2 millimeter yeah, yeah it's a bigger case for sure but yeah. I'm saying the Sport Evolution was also 43, so I know it's a totally wearable size because I have one of those. The Sport Evolution was awesome. Was yeah. So great. This is not a replacement. I guess it's like a sp it's a spiritual cousin to it, but this is not a replacement of the Sport Evolution. That was really great. The, the Sport Evolution with the, with the black dial and this red impact pads or whatever they were called, they were really freaking yeah. cool. Yeah, I like that watch a lot. Um, okay, let's so let's move on. So uh, Geo, strong year for them. You know, check out check out a C a CQ. CQ now it's Sequest, permanently Sequest in my mind. <laughs> um, okay, so Breguet had a probably the most beautiful watch, and this was the Breguet Classique Tourbillon Extra Plot Squelette, fifty three ninety five. I mean, their their watch names are so so extensive. We'll just call it the fifty three ninety five. And the funny thing is, if you don't understand how the brand works. You look at the dial of a watch, and and somewhere on the dial is a number, and you're like, "What is that number? Is that the reference number?" No. So I'm looking at the dial. This is the picture that Breguet made, and it says 1997 on the dial. You would legitimately think that that number so has confusing. something. Yeah, you you would like, oh, that has something to do with the 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 case or the or in the movement. No. So what it is, it's, it goes back to the 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 history of the brand, the movement and case each had a number that needed to match. And they were trying to prevent people from taking a movement and putting in another case or something like that. So the idea was that the number on the dial or on the movement was kind of random, but it had to match the one that was on the case. And that was like yep. a security mechanism. Today, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything at all. But they kind of kept it as a quirk. And yeah, I mean, no one's going to take out this movement and put it in their case, but maybe like 100 years from now, who knows? So, But the uh, idea is like they keep it around as a bit of a vestige yeah. From the past, but they don't do a good job explaining it. But it's part. But this is part of Breguet. They don't. It's like they don't care. Here's another picture. that says 1980 on here. So if you looked at it and you didn't know this, it could drive you mad. You'd be like, "What are these numbers?" And you could do research, and and you'd have no idea. And so it's I'm a just, particularly, uh, you know, like um, uh, unfortunate number because it's it's a recent year, you know. So it's like, what what happened in '97? Like, well, do you do you always want to be reminded of, of that year? It's just so, so funny. So let's talk about what's going on here. This is not a new case, and it's not a new collection. It's just a skeletonized version. Of this the is ass movement. a, it's like three and a half millimeter thick, maybe less, yeah. automatic tourbillon. So it has a peripheral rotor. Mm -hmm. You know, so does Carlette Bucherer, and the Carlette Bucherer one is, I think, over. It's it's not ultra thin. Not this is this is just thin. I wouldn't call this the the Breguet ultra thin, but I don't need ultra thin. But the, the Carla Bucara one is nice, but they also have um, a tourbillon and, and a peripheral automatic rotor. But it's it's over 100000 It's an expensive tourbillon, but it's nicely done. They told me they can't keep those in stock. They didn't think that uh, they would be As Bucara popular. or Breguet? At Bucara. Yeah. This is Breguet's bread and butter. Yeah. It's a it's a gorgeous timepiece. You got everything. You got you got the the, the guilloche engraving, the machine engraving on, on various surfaces. Really attractive skeletonization work. It's a combination of elegant. It's also masculine. You have a sapphire crystal that has hour markers on there and small applied blued steel hour markers that match the hands. Yeah. The platinum one is the, is the really cool one because it has a platinum case and the movement appears to be rose gold. It is very cool. So what was the price of this one? I, I have to remember. Yeah, I'm remember. looking for it right now. <clears throat> 235000 Whoa. It's, that's, that's it's a lot. No, but you know what? This has everything. It has all the work in it. it has, and you can wear it every single day, no problem. Yeah, I guess that's right. So this is the 581 movement. They call it the 581 SQ because it's uh, skelet, skeletonized. This is what, if you want a watch to impress everyone, watch collectors, uh, luxury seekers, the general public, men, women, people anywhere, 
no one's going to look at this and be like, oh, yeah, whatever. Like, this is cool. This yeah, is very I cool. It's classy. It's not for everyone, but it's very, very cool. And, you know, I'm, I'm as, as kind of, as kind of skeleton a crew as we sometimes feel that happen over at the Swatch Group brands, the, the manufacturing side still appears to be living and breathing well. So yeah. I like that there's someone at Breguet making this type of stuff. Like this required a lot of effort. This was this was a major pro a project, and I think that you know even at that price point, I think you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. I still think you get more bang for your buck in a Breguet than a Patek Philippe, especially these days. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Not saying Patek's a bad watch, but I think you get a better value in Breguet. I mean, you get you get a lot more for your money at a little bit less price. And I feel like the the, the volumes are kind of lower with a Breguet. Especially with stuff like this. Oh yeah, that goes without saying. That goes without saying. And uh, at least for now, you can still buy it, right? Um, okay, let's. I'm trying to think. Is anything else that came out? Um, that's it. I mean, we've seen. We we covered stuff from other Swatch Group brands, you know, such as uh, Tissot and Hamilton and Longines, and we'll we'll cover that more because I think they they launch at separate times. There'll be more stuff um, throughout the year. Um, Swatch Group, I think, has a long-term strategy right now, and Richemont has finally said things like, oh, we admit it's a transitional year. I've been saying things are in, we're in a transitional period for several years. Now yes, they just exactly. admit it. Yes. Nobody e ever wanted to say it. Yeah, well, it, it, they say it like once every three, three years, three to four years. Sometimes they're like, well, this is a transitional year, and then there's an amazing year when they ship everything out, and for two years, and then the third year they buy half of it back. <laughs> <So> <laughs> but but look, I'm not I'm not trying to give ourselves undue credit here. But we have been using the term transformational to talk about what's going on in the watch industry. Yeah, for the period. Like yeah. no one else was talking about it. Now they're tr they're finally starting to use the same terminology that on a blog to watch I and other team members have been saying about yeah. what's going on in the watch industry. Which tells us a few things. It, it, it's not. It's not just validating. It tells us that they are listening to what we're telling them, and we know this. They re they read. You know, every single article. Like we write a mistake about a brand, we do not tell the brand that we published it. What does it like take? Forty five minutes sometimes. Mm. They're like, yeah. yo, there's a little factual error here, and of course, you know, we'll, we'll fix it. It's usually an innocent mistake, but the idea is that the brands and the watch industry is is paying very close close attention so we're doing our best to give good advice and when we when we critique products what we're trying to do essentially is show the the brands this is how the consumer approaches it we're we're giving the sort of normal consumer who thinks these things a voice we're not trying to be mean we're just like mirroring or just echoing what a lot of people is, are thinking on a regular basis that's true it just takes a lot of damn time for it to filter through Okay, so we have been speaking uh, for more than half the show about this. We want to talk about two other topics. Um, David, it's going to be up to you. Are we talking about Konstantin Chaikin or are we talking about Rolex? Let's talk about Rolex first. Okay. So I wrote an article that published on May 19th titled, Today's Traditional Watch Industry Can't Exist Without What Rolex Is Selling. And I discussed how without the marketing engine that Rolex continues to fund year in, year out, there would not be enough of a global demand for watches. I, I boil down my argument to a very simple observation, and that is in order for a luxury watch to be a thing, meaning to be desired, to be something people want to pay for, to be something that people want to make, people have to recognize these objects when worn by others and say to themselves, that's an expensive thing, that's a nice thing. That's a well-made thing. Some type of positive attribute that communicates this item has value. If it's just inherent value, meaning the worth of a watch is only the time and effort put into it, and you need to know that, this industry just you know goes bankrupt in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yes. People buy these things because they're like, man, people are going to think something awesome when they see this on my wrist. I'm not trying to cheapen it for people. I feel bad if that sort of like pulls away the curtain too much. But that's that's what's going on in people's minds ultimately. Now the way we manifest that and the way we express that can be very playful. It doesn't have to be I have a lot of money. It can be yes I have money but but I also have a sense of humor. 
That's a mm. wonderful thing to express, and you can do that with a watch. You don't just have to express, I got wads of cash, cash and I definitely know how to spend it. It's all very true. So how does it filter back to, circle back to Rolex marketing? Well, <clears throat> the notion is this, and we could talk about how Rolex is structured as a business entity, you know, ad nauseum. The bottom line is that Rolex spends a significant amount of the money it makes by selling watches back into marketing. More money, I argue, than most other brands, and so much money collectively that Rolex is almost solely responsible for, for being a backbone, if you will, of creating global demand for luxury watches. Rolex spends money that maybe others should be spending, but it's pulling more than its fair share of the weight of selling oh, yeah. luxury watches. And what I'm also sort of saying is that pretty much every other luxury watch is sold as an alternative to Rolex. And I don't specifically say this in the article, but I, I infer it. Meaning that when you buy, let's say, an Audemars Piguet, you don't you never go straight to Audemars Piguet. You're like, I'm buying this instead of a Rolex. Like I know I can buy a Rolex. I'm making a conscious decision to buy this instead of a Rolex. You don't say to yourself, um, you know, boy, I'm buying um you know, I'm buying a Jager because um I'm buying an alternative to an IWC. No, you would never say anything like that. But the the consumer is always thinking when they buy something, <clears throat> I'm buying this instead of a Rolex. And that is because Rolex is responsible because it, of, of the massive amount of marketing it spends. And I go into this more in detail in the article. I'm not trying to prove the argument here. But I say that they create so much global demand that without them, collectively, all the other brands combined are not creating enough global awareness for watches to sustain a luxury watch industry. And I think that's the real point. That's absolutely true. And if, well, the question is something that we we will never know the answer to is whether or not they would have what it takes to step up if Rolex stopped doing this. But Rolex won't stop doing this because it's, you have to keep fueling the machine. And this puts everyone else in this rather lazy and directionless position when it comes to marketing. I mean, there are a few novel and, 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 and cool approaches and efforts, but they are very few and very far between. So let's talk about one of the reasons why I believe the other brands would not be able to fill in the gap if Rolex didn't didn't exist. And that has to do with the availability of budget for marketing. Rolex is people have called it a not profit, which is incorrect. It is not a non profit. But it is true that Rolex is not trying to extract massive profit from the company. They want to pay all their bills, they want to grow steadily, they want to make sure their employees are treated right, and they want to protect their brand by innovating, for sure. But Rolex could easily take a lot more money out of the company that reinvests. And spending money into marketing is a function of reinvestment. Whereas that other companies that are, say, have shareholders, the shareholders want profit. So you always have the, uh, th this struggle between reinvesting the money back into the brand and giving money to shareholders or stakeholders or something like that. Rolex is set up in a way where it does not have that pressure. And so Rolex is free and has the budget to spend a large volume into marketing. And I said that most other brands, even if they wanted to, could not actually pull together enough money to even chip away at the, the institution, which is the Rolex marketing machine. It's absolutely true. That's right. And then there's also the thing that if you stop doing something for long enough, you forget how to do it. What's the best practice in there? So I think a lot of these brands, even if they had all the money to burn in the world, they would still be rather clueless and they would just be hiring DiCaprio again and whatever. You know, so it would not result in the sort of relatively, you know, actually genuinely breathtaking marketing that the Rolex often does, uh, that brings you closer to the product itself. And it's weird because Rolex is one of those very few brands that does okay without associating a face with the brand. I mean, it has its testimonies, but when you think of Rolex, I mean, I guess some people will think of some of the ambassadors or testimonies as Rolex starts to call them. But when you think of Rolex, you often think of a brand. Well, with other brands, I feel like they really are trying to associate a face or a celebrity or whatever, or a movie or something like that with the brand. And, and Rolex, it's, there's so many ways of looking at it 
even if some part of Rolex doesn't appeal to you, there, you're bound to find a type of product and a type of marketing message from Rolex that will more or less appeal to you. And other brands are often just standing on just one one foot in that in in that respect. One of the things I don't talk about at all, and I honestly don't have an opinion about, is the design of Rolex watches. The design of Rolex watches has nothing to do with my argument in any way, shape, or form. The design of the yeah. watches is a different matter altogether. It's They have some great designs. They have some boring designs. They have everything between. Their designs are, in a sense, uh, simplistic and effective. What I'm talking about is something that Rolex does about educating people about what a luxury watch is. Yes, part of it is saying, you know, our design represents what a luxury watch is, but honestly, you could you could swap out some of these designs and put something else in here and Rolex would have the exact same history. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. It, it's it's a messaging. It's a it's a function of messaging. Basically the call to action here guys is is that you'll read the article which is styled um, it's titled Today's Traditional Watch Industry Can't Exist without what Rolex is selling and it's on a block to watch it's a major feature article written by Ariel and it explains the whole thing in, in greater detail I wanted to see some people um, <clears throat> really disagree with me there's 72 comments and we published it uh, I guess a day ago <sighs> you know this one guy only negative thing I said this was a pretty garbage article for me I'm like okay and then he doesn't say anything about my argument at all all he's saying is that I'm not that into Rolex and I like my El Primero. Um, <clears throat> he's not saying anything about my argument. And so there are people online that literally just look at a title, scan some pictures, and be like, I don't like Rolex. I mean, I don't really think... Yeah, this one guy said rude response whether or not you agree with the arguments. I don't think this guy ever read it. All the other 72 people had nothing but... I mean, agreement, which was very flattering, but in rare. <laughs> yeah, this was this was nice um, that people uh, didn't see holes in my argument. I mean, look, I use the audience's feedback as a form of peer review. If there's a giant hole in my argument, I do want to fix it. Absolutely but true. I wonder if this changes people's perceptions of. You know about about when they want Rolex, they think why. I wonder if they're like, I still want it, but now I think I want it for a different reason. And it's not just about Rolex; it's about their perception of the entire industry and and how all these other brands with their tremendous egos fit into the whole equation when they are actually dependent on on somebody else, you know, outside of their circles, which is pretty funny. Um, all right, let's let's close this deal. Uh, unless you want anything else added to this Rolex matter, you want, by you look wanna, yeah, I mean, I think this is oh for the Rolex. I thought I thought you didn't want to talk about Chaikin. I do, yeah, obviously. Uh, yeah, read the article if you're interested in it. I I write about Rolex a lot because of its importance. It's not because I think it's the greatest brand in the world, though it is probably the greatest watch the watch brand. It it is because they do m more stuff right than anyone else. Mm -hmm. That's what Simple makes them the that. greatest. It, it it's it's not the design. There's nothing really remarkable about it. Or the history designs. or whatever. It's it's about, yeah, it's about exactly what they you said. They make an extremely well-made version of an unremarkable design. Um, and we love them for that. We love them for how well they're made. And and as a marketing uh, company, that's an entirely different story. It's 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 They're, they're both well-done things, in a sense, unrelated to one another. I just wish they would come up with something crazy like the Sky Dweller or the Yachtmaster 2. I want to see what Rolex could do today. I mean, over the last 20 years that, you know, over the last 20 years that we've been into this uh, century, really, um, those are the two completely new watches or, or movements that Rolex has produced, apart from the 4130, which I is mean, in the Daytona. What I, what I, it, it happens every once, like six or seven years, but we haven't seen a completely new movement apart from the next generation updates that are in the uh, run of the mill watches. And I spent quite a bit of time researching the Sky Dweller and the Yachtmas too, and I'm incredibly, hugely impressed uh, by by their engineering. And I want to see this engineering approach and know-how that Rolex has being thrown into a new project that is not the Sky Dweller, not the Yachtmaster. And I, I, I do not believe that the, uh, all the options have been depleted because before the Sky Dweller existed, no nobody knew they would need a watch like the Sky Dweller or the Yachtmaster. You know, right. 
Yeah, I mean, we're getting into a whole other topic there about Rolex yeah. movements and stuff like that. That's that's okay. That's moving, for another discussion. Moving on. So you published your review of the Konstantin Chaik and Joker. Um, very nice pictures, by the way, David. Thank you. I you have. I guess you would call it the standard dial, which yes. is silver, red, and green. Mm -hmm. I have a modified version of it. Um, when we saw this watch, it was kind of like the one of the closest things I could say to love at first sight with a watch. Not the only time it's ever happened, but I think collectively so many people like saw this and were like, that's awesome. Yeah. Now, it start, your, your love affair started there. Where did it go after that? Well, I've been I've been wearing it on and off quite a, for quite a bit of time. It's it's funny because it's such a specific looking watch and it evo it evoked such powerful emotions in comparison to other watches is that I don't want to wear it all the time, which is pretty weird because I like the watch so much. So sometimes it's just sitting on a shelf and sometimes I'm, I I wear it for for uh, successive days. Uh, I, I love this watch very much, and I explain it in great detail in the article. But the point is that it, it evokes emotions that other watches do not evoke, because ma mainly because it's not part of this box ticking, you know, top trumps game that the other watches are playing. Because most all other watches are about doing the same thing and doing it a tiny little better or a tiny little bit different than others are doing it. And then there is this watch with a freaking face on it, you know, that you you cannot really get any more. Uh, Away, further away from the status quo than than what Constantine has done with the with the choker. So and and yet it lives up all to all the expectations that one would have for a seven thousand euro watch because the workmanship, the the quality of execution is just fantastic, bar none. And not just because it's a quirky watch that's well made or relatively well made, but it's because it's well made. Full stop. So so that creates this really weird experience where you're wearing something that's so much fun that's so genuine that's so creative and then um, that is so impressively made and there are so, very few watches like that let me ask you a question i think this is something that a lot of people want to know um i have my opinion on the matter did you find this watch to be easy to read yes absolutely yeah I didn't. I didn't think I would, but I did. I I spent. I don't spend any more time trying to figure out what time it is than with any other watch. I really don't. I I agree. Actually, I uh, was surprised at how legible it is, and it's regulator style, which basically separates the hours and the minutes dials. Yes. The pupil of the eye is, you know, large it's, enough. It's, it's large enough, high enough contrast. I don't have any problems on the scales and. I feel like my brain knows what to do with two different dials more so than it knows what to do with like one dial that has the hours and the minutes and I feel like in a sense this is actually m more effective because there's less con possible yes. confusion. Yeah, the the time that you lose by by it being relatively small, uh, you went back by having them on two separate locations exactly. So I look at it, of course I'm not going to read the time with to the minute or to the second of courtesy, but I can get close enough, and when I'm wearing this watch, I don't really care about it, this minute or that minute or whatever. I look at it and it's, oh, it's about 32, whatever. Who cares? You know, so, so for that, it's, it's absolutely perfect, and if I want to know the time very accurately, I just wear the G-Shock that's um, synchronized, you know, or whatever. So with this watch on, I don't feel that way at all. Yeah, no, I, 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 found, it, I found it very easy to live with. It's mm -hmm. cool. You know what I actually found very weird? What? Um, so when you and I saw this, and maybe it was the name of the launch that gave it away, but I'm talking about like at Basel World when we first saw it. We went to the concert team. We're like, wow. We like immediately knew there was a face. Okay? Of course. We immediately knew there was a face. I showed my watch off to a lot of people, and I was like, it's a face. They're like, uh oh. What? I'm not kidding. So many people did not recognize it immediately as a face. I had to point out, like, there's a face. Well, maybe that's because yours has a different color scheme where it's a little bit more difficult because I, because so much of it is gray. Uh, the different components of the face don't stand, don't contrast that much. Maybe. Maybe that's maybe maybe that that made it a little bit more difficult for some people. But even then, it should be blatantly obvious that it has a mouth and two eyes and and a nose. So that that's really weird. I, I've never had that happen. <laughs> that's, I, that's weird. I mean, look, once people see it, they can't unsee it. 
But what I'm thinking is this, and this is normal. We look at watches all the time. Most people d wouldn't even know to see a face style. They would just be like, oh, that's a watch. That's a watch, you know, a normal watch face. They wouldn't know that it's something different. Yeah, that's true, because it's just a watch. You don't look at it that way. Well, I guess that's true. I also like the, how proportional it is and how wearable it is. And the movement is actually the, the, the Joker module is extremely well made. It's very pretty. That, that was one of the big surprises here. When I went to the manufacturer and I looked at the uncased um, uh, these modules that were being made, and I was like, wow, that's, that's a really neat looking module. So that was impressive too. Uh, of course, these are all sold out, but Constantin uh, will always, well, not always, but uh, currently makes a different version. It's called the Dracula, and it's a little bit more expensive. It's black case, and the funny thing about that is that it has the teeth of Dracula come out exactly at midnight, and they retract at 6 a.m., and he actually created this update. He made this update to the, uh, to the Joker module, so it has this mechanism that allows his teeth to come out. Yeah. And go back. So That's basically, just it, you know, as as a vampire, Dracula's yes. teeth function as as an AMPM indicator, and it's very That's elegant how at, at you know when they move up and down. So at night, the teeth are down, <clears throat> and then during the day, they're up. It's um, I mean, th what I love about the Joker, and I and I don't know this for sure, but I'm guessing it's going to be the type of watch that people will buy multiple versions of. Hmm. I actually think the exact other way because I personally wouldn't want another version because I, because it, the, the one that I have ticks all the boxes that it has to. Hold on, hold on. Think about five to ten years out. It's a great okay. concept for him. It makes sense for him to make more and more of them. And yeah. I think a lot of collectors are going to say, I want different colors. I want different types of faces. I want a person face. I want an animal face. I want a you know I want ones that are more decorative. I want more I guess ones that's more right. modern. There's going to be there's demand out there for a large variety of things, especially if he does 50 or 60 of them as a limited edition or something like that. Easy. Easy. Yeah. He, he literally could be set for the rest of his watchmaking career just making watches with this module. He could tweak it mm -hmm. here and there, but, you know, face We know the Constantine, dial. and that's not going to be not going to be true. So no, obviously... that's, that's true. That's true. He would get yeah. bored to death. He'd be like, screw this, but he could. He could. He could. And he, he could. might and hire people to do it. And he might hire other people to do it. We don't know. We don't know. But it's possible. Yeah. Um, he told me that he himself assembles the dials because uh, the dials take so much time, so much effort, and they're so freaking expensive and they're so delicate that he, 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 he finds genuine watchmaking challenge in assembling these dials. Which is pretty fun. I mean, this is the guy who makes Levitas watches and watches that play jazz music and keep time on Mars and so on. So if he finds that fascinating, I think that says a lot about how complex his style is. But you know, it's you know, it's kind of unfortunate, and I don't really. I mean, this will, I guess, work itself out in the future. But because he's producing in Russia, and some of the the I guess the restrictions on Russian trade around the world. It's very difficult for him to get his his product around the world. Oh well, well, then, well that sucks. It's true. So I again, I don't know the latest status on that, but it's very interesting to see how geopolitics plays into the world of watches, where you have someone whose products want to be out there in the world market. There's demand for them, but merely getting them to the customer is a challenge. So the people that have these watches, a lot of them had to make a trip somewhere. He had to meet them maybe in Europe, something like that, or in Russia. I think that there's a very interesting element to the brand where its you know, its exclusivity is sort of insured right now because just getting one's a challenge. Yeah, that's true. And getting one is a challenge also because these get sold out so freaking fast. I mean, these are selling for double retail. Go on, right, go on eBay right now. I want you to type in Konstantin Chaik and see if anything shows up. I'm just curious. It could be a bunch of stuff. I have no idea. I'm gonna check my I can tell you it's not gonna be a bunch of stuff. Like it's sight unseen, I, I can tell you for sure it's not gonna be a bunch of stuff. Okay, there's okay, there's one joker. Wow, eighteen thousand bucks pre owned. Holy moly, that's a lot. That's it. And then just and then just a bunch of well, a couple of books and that's it. One watch, it's a joker. It's a st it's a stock model. That is it's in the U.S. here. 
That is what that's way more than double the price. And there is a book by Constantine. That's pretty cool. Wow. Watchmaking in Russia. That's that's really cool. I mean, this guy is just. If, even by watchmaker standards, like independent watchmaker standards, it's just it's incredible. I've written an article where I explain, you know, how he works and and what he does best in in the trade, um, in, in the manufacture of his article. I'm not gonna get started on that because otherwise we'll be here all day. But but we get um, to look at this Invicta Joker watch. Oh my God, that's that's just tragic. <laughs> no, don't even get. get <laughs> oh wow. That's, just, that should be no, no. I mean, even is, for Invicta, that's a new low. Okay. This is impressively ridiculous. I it's love just, this. I love that this exists. I had no idea this exists. I hate that it exists. <laughs> hey, look. You know what? Terrible. You know what? This is a uh, wow. This is incredible. This is so. I really want to like find no. something from Invicta and be like, oh, that's cool. But it's like their it's like their designers are trying to be obnoxious. It's like they're laughing at me. They're like, "Ha ha! Wait till you see this." It's like, "Oh." I think that's your way of looking at it. I get really pissed off because it's just a blatant copy. That's that's, that's a problem. No, it's not a. It's not really a copy. The eyes right. are the chronograph subdials. This this is like, this is impressively insane. I gotta okay. I'm gonna check this thing out later. Um. Okay, so we covered a lot of stuff today. This was a good show. The the Constantine Chaikin Joker is definitely something you should look for. Um, you know, if if you're into the watch, have no hesitations about it. But it doesn't look like it's going to be something which is easy for a lot of people to get. Right. We uh we have a lot of travel coming up. I'm going to Monaco, and David is going to Italy, and we're going to some fancy events, and we're hopefully going to see some fancy watches and learn about some cool stuff coming up. So, David, good travels to you. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye.